I forgot to mention this in the intro, but the full source is on my Patreon. Thank you to my first two supporters, Matt and Control. Thank you guys so much for 790 subscribers at the time of recording this, and I love you all. Hello everyone, Idle here, and this is going to be a part two on the last video that I made of Idle 2 CPP Unity Game Hacking. Well, not really a part two because I am switching games to 1v1.lol. This is basically a Fortnite clone. Some, it's, yeah, yeah it's, that's all I can call it. It's basically a fake Fortnite. Um, I do recommend you watch the last video if you haven't. You don't really have to because this is a different game. I'm going to be going over some of the same stuff, but the last video does have information that would be useful. So I have the game installed here, and if I go to the game files, you'll see that the game is actually mono and not IL2CPP. Shout out to Mate from my Discord server for reminding me before I started recording. The game did update today, and it was IL2CPP yesterday. They did quote unquote performance and bug fixes, but they, all they did was switch it back to mono. If you go to SteamDB and search up 1v1.lol, you go to the depots and the public depot. Go to this one right here. This is the, the main game. And this is the current version of the game. You'll see data, all this stuff. The build ID is what matters. And you'll see the add, they added this stuff and they removed, where is it? Game assembly. So game assembly.dll is a IO2 CPP thing. They removed this in today's update. So all we have to do is go back to the last update. You can do that by selecting view all patches. And you will see this one right here, January 16th. Today is the 31st. This is today's update. This is the last update. So I'll go to this one. And you'll see that they, if I search up game assembly, they added gameassembly.dlo. So here's what we have to do. Since the game is mono currently, the one that we just installed, I have to revert to the older version. The way that you can do that is closing Steam. I'll have everything in the description, by the way. So you close Steam. You will click on your shortcut for opening Steam. Go to properties, and then you'll see steam.exe. Make sure it's the target line, not the start in line. You see steam.exe. After steam.exe, you'll put a space, a dash, and then type in console. Click apply. Then you open up Steam. You sign into your Steam account. and you'll see a console thing up here. If it's not up here, you can right click on Steam and it could be down here as well. You click the console and you will run this command, download depot manifest, and it's going to start downloading. So basically what I just did is download depot. This is the app ID for 1v1.lo if I go to SteamDB. So 2305791. This is depot 2305791 for the game 2305791. That's just the the game ID. So I got it, I got it mixed up. I got it mixed up. This is the depot ID, this is the game ID, and this is the manifest. The manifest is basically the version that you're downloading. So if I did this, this is change history. This is where so you see added. This is the manifest where they added IL2CPP. I know it's kind of confusing, but this is basically, I'm basically reverting back to the old game. I'm downloading the old game with IL2CPP because the current version is mono. Once you run this command, it'll start downloading. It won't give you any percentage or um, any like progress it will take a minute it is slower than the normal downloading process on steam if you go to where you have steam installed so your c i have it in my c drive c program files 86 
Steam and it should be in Steam apps and content. This is the app ID, so this is the game. This is the depot and this is the version. It's downloading right now. It'll give you a notification that says download complete in the console when it is finished and you'll have all the files. So I'm just going to cut the video until it's finished. So in the console, when the download is finished, it'll tell you depot download complete and it'll give you a path where it was installed to. Um, but it is usually where your Steam is installed, your Steam apps folder, and there should be a content folder. Go to app, depot, and then this should be the game right here. Since you installed the game, you have the mono version and the IL2 CPP version now. What you need to do is right click the game in your Steam library, go to manage, and browse local files. So this is the mono version. This is the version that we currently have installed. We will delete all of the old files and we will go to the depot download that we did. So this is the old version. We're going to move all the files to our folder where the game is downloaded. So we're basically replacing the game with the old one. So once that's finished, you still can't open your game. There's something else you need to do. Go back a folder and there should be, oh, it's not in this folder. Go back a folder again in your Steam apps folder, wherever you have the game downloaded. I'm using my C and D drive. So the old version was on my C drive and I moved it to the new version on my D drive, if that makes sense. I replaced it on my D drive. So what we need to do is do app manifest and we need to do a search for um, 1v1.lol. I know that 1v1.lol's ID starts with 2.3, so it's one of these. Let me double check. On SteamDB, they should have the version or the app ID. So it's 2.305790. 2.305790. So this is this is the one. So what you need to do is disable, oh, what's what's going on here? <laughs> what you need to do is disable updates. So this manifest is basically what tells Steam what your game version is. This manifest is the version of the game that we have installed. And the state flags, I'm not too sure, but if you set this to six, what we need to do is edit the state flags. If you set this to six, this basically tells Steam never update our game. We don't need we don't need our game updated. That's that's basically what we're doing here. So you set this to six. Once you set this to six, you can close it and then open the game. If you did it right, it shouldn't update your game. You should be on IL2 CPP and not mono. So let me open up Process Hacker. The way that you can verify that it isn't mono is if you open a Process Hacker and you do 1v1, I'm going to click properties and modules, and we're going to look for a game assembly module. Yep, we have gameassembly.dll. So we are running on IL2 CPP. We just reverted the game from mono to IL2 CPP. Now that we have that, we can go and dump the game. I'm just making sure that the uh, online functionality works right now, making sure that I can get into a game. So yeah, I'm in a match on an outdated version of the game, on an older version. So I'm going to close my game. Now we can actually dump the game. So I'm going to get IL2 CPP dumper GUI from here. And for the executable, I'm going to select the game assembly in our Steam Apps common one view on lo We're basically going to the game path here. Game assembly, global metadata should be in the games folder, data, IL2 CPP data, metadata, global metadata, and then we're going to start dumping. Wait for the dump to finish. Now that we have the game dumped, I'm going to open up item and we are going to disassemble a new file. We're going to disassemble the game assembly from the game's path where we have it installed. We're going to load it as a portable executable. And if it asks you for a PDB, select no or cancel whatever it gives you the option to do i'm going to wait for it to load now this is going to take a second
Alright, so we have the game loaded up in IDA and it is analyzing as you can see in the bottom left. The first thing you need to do is click on Edit, Segments, Rebase Program, and then type a zero here and then click OK. I already did it, so I'm not going to do it again. Then once you do that, let your game finish analyzing. I made a mistake in the last video. I ran the Python script before letting it finish analyzing. I have sat here and let this analyze for about 15 minutes now, so I'm just going to run the script. It still hasn't finished analyzing, but I think it's analyzed enough functions for the script to run without a lot of errors. So I'm going to let the script run and I'll be, I'll be back. If you do get this bad declaration warning, you can just click don't display this message again and then click OK. There will be a lot of them, that's at least what I've gotten, but um, the script should work nonetheless. Okay, so the script did take a long time to run, but I can see why there are a lot of functions in this game. I'm just going to search up camera just to make sure that at least the camera class is here. Give it a second because it's lagging. Yep, look, it looks like, yeah, everything's here. Also, I did not fully analyze. You don't need to fully analyze everything. You just need to give it like, I want to say three minutes after loading it up before running the script, or you will get way more errors. So what I'm going to do now that we have the dump is go to my GitHub. And on my GitHub, you will get the IL2 CPP base. Once again, I did do this in my last video, but I am restarting. So you can just, if you do have the old source, just delete it and restart your code. Because this is a different game, so we're going to use different code. I'm going to open up the project in Visual Studio. And it should open to a blank project. Yep, just like this. This, way, this is what you should see. On the right, you have the IL2 CPP project. Press the arrow, go to source files, go to main, and let it load. Then you want to scroll to the bottom to the DLL main function, of course. Main thread, init, and then you have it right here. We're going to comment out enable hooks and comment out find six and then we are going to build. Oh, build and release, not debug. Now that it's built, we can go to the game on Steam and open it. And then I'm going to get Process Hacker. And then we can inject, where is it? inject this DLO is in my YT tutorial folder back to process hacker it's going to load it shouldn't have anything here in this output and then in game I'm pretty sure the FOV changer works yep the camera so there we go we can zoom in and out on the FOV if this works then we can continue if it doesn't work join my discord server and I'll try to help you out so what we need to do now is get Unity Explorer, which will make it easier to see the classes in the game and the classes on objects, the components of objects, I should say. So we are going to get Melon Loader, go here. The Melon Loader installer. And we are going to select 1v1.llo install and click OK and then we're going to open the game again Melon Loader should load up it's going to generate assemblies the first time you do run Melon Loader so just give it some time When Melon Loader finishes generating its assemblies, your game should open as normal, but I haven't installed Unity Explorer, so nothing's going to happen. We don't have any mods loaded. I'm going to close the game, and if you need Unity Explorer, join my Discord server once again. It is in this FIOS channel. You shouldn't use the one off of GitHub because 
that one is broken for the new mountain loader so this is a fixed one right here so we can go download this fixed mountain loader and then we're going to open it and then we can go to the games folder oh I just hit the game on Steam I'm so smart <laughs> okay so we'll right click and we're not going to hide the game this time we're going to go to manage browse local files and then in the game's files, we are going to drag the Unity Explorer mods into our game files folder. So the root of the game, make sure it's mods and user libs, mods and user libs. So that matches up. You can close this and then open up your game. And then you'll see in your mountain loader console window, Unity Explorer, one mod loaded, and your game should open as normal. And then you can see Unity Explorer right here. So now what we'll do is we'll use this to figure out what components are on a player in the game. So we're going to load into a solo match. And then you want to press F7 to bring up Unity Explorer. Go to the inspector at the top. Go to mouse inspect. Click on world. Then you can see anything that you have your mouse over will be selected by Unity Explorer. So I'm going to put my mouse over myself and you can see it says click to inspect poly player clone. So that's a player. I'm going to click on myself. Looks like players have something called a player building manager, a player controller, player IK. They have a weapons controller. They have a skin manager and they have a health component. I think I'm going to go with the player controller. So now that we know all players have a player controller, so let's look at someone else just to make sure. So we're going to click on this person, if I don't die. This is a poly player. They have a player controller. So yeah, they look, it looks like they have the same components that I do. So every player has a player controller. We're going to close the game. And then back to our source. We can scroll to the bottom you can see that we have a player cache thread that we're creating. Control click on this, and you can see when we add to our player list, we are pushing back something that has a component of a character controller. But we know that all players have a player controller. So instead of a character controller, we're going to set player controller here. Now what this should do is anything with a player controller will be added to our player list. We can build this. Let's make sure. We're not setting our local player, so we need to comment this out. Yeah, I remember I made this mistake yesterday. So let me cancel this build. So I have to comment this line out because we don't know who local player is yet. So if we try to get this function, it's just going to return and nothing's going to happen. So we can build now. And then we can open the game. Okay, so we have the game open. Let's make sure that our build is finished. Yep, our DL finished building. So now what we'll do is go back to Process Hacker. Did I close it? Oh no, it's still open. So we'll go back to Process Hacker and we will inject our DLL that we just built. Now with our changed code, we should be able to do snap lines. I'm pressing Alt to grab my mouse to uncapture my mouse from the game player snap lines and there we go there's a line under every player so there we go you just did ESP and I don't even know in a few minutes there's a there's snap line ESP now what you'll notice is that we have a line under ourselves we need to filter ourselves out and also I know that there's another issue that I'm going to show press insert to close this menu there's another issue that if someone dies they're still showing that there's still a line there where that person died. That shouldn't happen. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to close that. Close the game. Yep. Alt F4. So in our code, what we're doing is if vars player snap lines. So if player snap lines is on, we're setting the root position. We're getting the player position, and then we're just setting the uh, root position a little bit lower than the position that we're getting. I'm just doing that to compensate. For some games, the 
tra get transform position, sometimes it's not in the right spot. So I made it a bit lower than it should be. That's fine. So what we're going to do now is filter out people that are dead. The way that you do that is this right here, the player list current index, this is a game object. As, as you can see, if we control click on player list, this is a list of game objects. And if we go back to our player cache, I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain this so it makes sense to you. Um, let me go back to find it. Oh my God. So control click on player cache. We are getting anything that has the component of player controller. We're checking if it's valid. And then if it is valid, we are pushing it back, but we're pushing back the game object. We're not pushing back the component. We are pushing the game object. So we have a list of all of the player game objects. And then down here in our render loop, we are looping through every player game object. So let me open my game and show you how we're going to do our check if people are dead or not. Okay, so we are back in the game. Let's open up the inspector. Let's go world and then click on ourselves. You can see player controller. And then if you click on it, it'll give you a list of everything. I don't usually use fields or the constructor that just adds extra stuff. So I, I usually filter these out and then I start scrolling. So let's see if we can find something that says is dead or something like that. Or at the top, we need to search dead. Nope, there isn't. So in this situation, you can see a lot of the stuff is obfuscated. But in this situation, what you can do is sometimes in Unity Explorer, it does not show all of the functions. So this is why we dump the game in Ida. In Ida, if we put player controller, and then we put two dollar signs for the like function, actual function name, we scroll up, this is rewired player controller. This isn't the actual player controller. We need to find the one that's just player controller. So this one, you can see player controller, get is dead. So this is a function in the player controller component that we can call. I'm going to show you how to call this function. It returns a bool and it tells us if it's dead. So this will return true if a player is dead. And remember, we're getting the player's game object so we can access all the player's components. We can access all of this. You can hear the game in the background. I'm actually going to mute it so you don't hear it. So in our player list, we're getting the player objects. We need to access the player controller component to access the is dead function. So in our render loop where we are doing the loop through the game objects, you can see if snap lines, we're getting the player position. I'm going to remove this line. This is just setting a variable to the current player index. We can just remove that and just use I here. So yeah, you can remove that line. So we're checking if the player is valid. We're going to make a new line. I'm going to do auto. I'm going to name this player controller, our current, current player controller. Did I spell that right? Yeah, I did. Equals player list. Also, yeah, I'm going to remove this local player line. Player list. I, we're going to access the player. So this is the pointer to the player. We're going to do get component because we're in the player's object. We're not in the component. We are in the player object. So basically, let me try to explain this. Maybe, maybe here. So every Unity object has a bunch of components attached to it. This is what we're accessing. We're accessing this in our code. So we're going to do get component. Since players have a player component, our player controller component, we're going to do get component player controller. If player controller or if current player controller, if there is no current player controller, we're going to continue. Because if there's no player controller, that means they're invalid. So with this, we can do another check after this line. Current player controller. We're accessing the player controller now. Call method safe. And then you do opening brackets, 
bool. This is what the function returns. And then you open parentheses. The method name is get is dead. In Ida, you can see a get is dead. So you put get is dead here, and you can see that it doesn't take in any other arguments except for the player controller. We don't need to send this to the function because we're already accessing the controller. So we can do that. Name this a bool. Bool is dead equals current player controller call method save get is dead. If is dead. Continue. So if the player is dead, we are going to skip them. And I'm going to build this. Okay, it built. So I'm going to go into a match and then inject this. So just, just to uh, recap, we are in our player list, our, our main render loop function. We're in the render loop. In our player list, we're accessing the player, we're checking if the player is valid, and then we're getting the player controller component off of that player. After we get the player controller component, we use the component to call a function in the player controller component called get is dead. And that function gives us a bool, tells us if the player is dead or not. In Ida, you can see right here, get is downed, get is dead, get is grounded. So you can call all of these functions. So let's say if I wanted to do a is down check, I would copy get is down. I would make a new one, press control D on that line, paste it, and then is down. So if I wanted to filter down to people, I would make a new line saying is down. There, now we, we filter out people that are dead and downed. Oh, my game just crashed. <laughs> I probably should have been looking. But yeah, we're gonna build that. So yeah, we can call these two functions right here. All right, I got into a match. I'm going to open a process hacker and inject our DLL. We're going to do player snap lines, and there we go. Now I have to wait to get into the. I have to wait for the match to start to test if dead players show or not. If I can kill this person, I'm bad. Oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, they died and they don't show anymore. And then there's a duos game mode. And in the duos game mode, someone gets downed before they get killed. So if someone gets downed in duos, they wouldn't show either. That's what those two checks do. So we're calling the get is dead function to check if the player is dead or not. And it worked. So now we're able to filter players if they are dead or downed. Now we need to filter ourselves out of the list. If we look at item and look at the player controller class, let's see. We're going to look for something called get mine. So we have this function right here. Now we can go down into our find six function. Make sure it's uncommented. So I'm going to control click. I'm going to control click on the offsets first. And then I'm going to do get local player. I'm going to name this get local player. So I'm going to do control D, get local player controller. So this is going to hold the offset for this function. So this is it right here. I'm going to go back. I'm going to change this to get local player controller. So we're going to change both of these. And then player controller class. So I'm going to copy that, I'm going to replace the combat master one, and I'm going to rename this to player controller, player controller class. And then the function is get mine. So we're going to do get mine. Now we have the offset to the get mine function in the player controller class. If I go to functions.h, it should be over here. If you go to game and then functions.h, it should be right here. It's a header file. We have the game functions region. So we have get main camera right here. I'm going to copy this, put two lines, paste it. So what does get mine do? 
it gives us a player controller. When you dump a game using IL2CPP Dumper GUI, let me go to the game files right now. When you dump a game using IL2CPP Dumper GUI, you will get this IL2CPP.h header. You can open this header. I use Visual Studio Code, but you can open this header and it opened on my other monitor. It is loading. So in this header, this is the header file generated from the dump. In this header, it contains the structures for the game. So if I go to Ida and I search up player controller and I look through the header, we have a player controller. I'll do player controller underscore fields. So this is everything inside of a player controller. Is changing state, is changing allowed, is strafing. So how do you import this into your code? You will copy the whole header, so control A, right click, copy. It is a really big file, so expect expect it to lag. Yeah, I'm already, I'm already lagging. I'll close Visual Studio Code. I'll go back to my code. There should be a header here already. I included it. It's from Combat Master, so you're gonna need to replace it. You'll double click. It's going to take a second to open because it is a huge file. And then right here, so you need, you're going to need these includes, Windows and STD int. So keep that in mind. I'm gonna press Control A. I'm going to delete everything in here. So there's nothing here. Then I'm going to paste the header that we copied. And it's going to take a minute, yeah. So it's going to wait for that. Okay, so it was pasted in. Once you paste it in, we're gonna go all the way to the top. After the, not after, above the type def void, put two lines. Give it a second, it's, it's a huge file. Yeah, Your Visual Studio is going to lag very heavily when doing this, but it is worth it. I'm gonna do hashtag pragma once, and then do hashtag include. I spelled include wrong. <laughs> Windows.h, hashtag include, include wrong again. <laughs> again, oh my God, include std int dot h and then try to build it's going to give you an error though it's going to give you multiple errors my visual studio is lagging <laughs> build solution i know it's going to error expect multiple errors i'll show you how to fix them though okay yeah as you can see i have a bunch of build errors now what you need to do is click on it look for the Look for the ones that have IL2CPP.h. Look for the those errors. If it says unexpected token, click on it. Give it a second. So we have return, and it's purple. It's a different color. It's because it conflicts with the C++ return statement. So we need to just do an underscore. We just need to rename it. That's that's all of these errors right here. We just need to rename these. Once again, my, vis my Visual Studio is lagging. So next error, return, I'm gonna just paste the underscore. Next error, return, paste the underscore. Just complete this process for every, every one that says unexpected token, just complete this process. You will paste an underscore after each one. It's just conflicting names, that's the error here. If you see syntax error constant, click on those. This is also a name conflict, the std in and std out. Just put underscores. Visual Studio is lagging again. I'm going to go through and fix all these. So STD out. If you see STD or returns, just put an underscore after them. I'm going to look for more. Oh yeah, H key. These are also another thing. So the registry keys. This is also a conflict. You need to underscore, put an underscore on all of these. trying to save the file. Your Visual Studio is going to lag a lot when doing this, 100%. There's just, there's just no avoiding it. You could use a different text editor to open it and change the file if you want, but it's better to do it in VS because it shows you where every error is already. So I'm just going through and checking, making sure. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. 
Looks like I can build it now. So I tried to build and you can see there's still more. That doesn't matter. That's not a conflict. Type name. Let's see. Right here. The int. I just saw it. So right here. The int32. That's a conflict right there. I'll put an underscore. And you see how a bunch of errors just disappeared. I'm going to try to build again. So if you have errors, just keep trying to build and then look through and see if any have to do with the IL2CPP header. Okay, no more of my errors have to do with the IL2CPP header. The error is in our functions.h header now. So let's go to our functions.h. The reason why we have this error is because this was a combat master structure. So we just need to change this to dword pointer. The reason why I'm not deleting this hook is because this can be used as a template for something else that you want to do. So I'm leaving it here. So after setting those two values to a dayword pointer, your error should go away. Now right here in the git main camera copy that we made, we're going to change this to the git mine function. It returns a player controller pointer. So we're going to copy that and put that into our code. And I'm going to rename this to git local player controller. And then the address right here should be the one that we grabbed from our find six function. So the get local player controller right there. And let's see, it takes in no objects. So what we can do is replace this function name right here. And the return type should be a player controller pointer, of course, right there. So we get local player controller from this function now. We should be able to call this now in our main and then in our player loop. So we scroll all the way back up. I cannot find the function right here. So we are setting local player to null and we're setting the player list to null. And then we loop through the player list. After setting local player to null, we're going to do functions get local player controller. And then I'm going to do auto. I'm going to name it auto. Auto LP controller equals get local player controller. If there is no local player controller, we are going to return. Or actually, we don't need to return. This is a loop, so we're going to continue, not return. So if there is no local player controller, we're going to continue, which will just go back up to the loop. Now, if we do have the local player controller, we can get the local player. So from the local player controller, we can cast this to a unity component because this is a struct, but it is also a unity component. This is a structure in the game, but it is also a unity component at the same time. So the way that we do this is we cast it using an open bracket or an open parentheses and then do unity. Why do I spell everything wrong today? <laughs> unity C component, C component, two C's. That's a camera, C component pointer, so the star, and then closing parentheses, that casts it into a component, and then we do local player controller, after the continue statement, we do local player controller, get game the object. So local player will equal local player controller get game object. So we now can get the local player object. Now back in our render loop, what we'll do is We'll check the player list, getting the game object, because these are these are game objects. We'll do if player list dot, it's player list i, I was going to say dot i, if player list i, so th if this game object is equal to our local player, I think it's a capital. Yeah, if if it's equal to local player, we're going to continue. So right now our local player should be filtered out. If I go into a match, let's try this. Oh, my DLO is still injected. Let me close. Yeah, I'm not making an uninject function. We're just going to restart every time. So we're going to build our DLO and reopen the game. Okay, our DLO has built and our game is open. I'm going to go into a match. And then I'm going to get process hacker. 
and then we're going to wait for our game to actually fully load because then we're going to inject all right so if i do snap lens there is no line under me anymore as you can see so we, we have filtered filtered ourselves out of the player list there we go so we now fixed dead players from rendering and we fixed esp in ourselves we won't get ourselves So if I kill that guy, yep, he's not rendering anymore because he's dead. All right, so that's finished. We can now go to the next step. Okay, what I'm going to do next is a skeleton ESP. So what we're doing here, just to just to reiterate, we're going through our player list. We're checking if the player is valid. We're checking if the player is ourselves. We're getting the player controller and we're using the player controller to check if they're dead and if they're downed. Then we get the player's position and we use that position to draw snap lines on the player. So I'm going to control click on VAR's player snap lines. Oh yeah, and if your Visual Studio does take a while to do these things, just use, just close this. This is probably still open. Your Visual Studio is going to lag if you leave that um, header open. But what I'm going to do is the snap lines thing is in my SDK header, so I'm going to go to my SDK. I'm going to scroll down. Bool player snap lines. I'm going to press Control D to duplicate that line. And then I'm going to do player skeleton. And then I'm going to go into my overlay, my menu.h. I'm going to scroll all the way down. I'm going to look for where I have player snap lines. I'm going to press Control D to duplicate the line. I'm going to do player skeleton. So we now have a checkbox to toggle player skeleton on and off. Now I'm going to show you how to get the bones of players. If I open up the game and load up Unity Explorer in a match, you'll see that players have a component called an animator. So let me give my game a second to load. So if I open up Unity Explorer and go to the inspector, I'll go to mouse inspect world, click on myself, and you see there is a Unity component called a Unity Engine Animator. I'll click on that. And Unity Engine Animators have something called Bone Position. Like it's called Get Bone Position Internal. It's a function. Get Bone Transform Internal. Get Bone Transform. I use the internal one. This one also works. There's not really a difference except for this one that uses an enumerator. But you should use the internal one if you don't know what this one does. So yeah, we're going to use Get Bone Transform Internal. Zero we have the hips let me try 50. so there's no bones at 50. let me try 40. there's bones at 40. let me try 45. 46. so bones stop at 45. that's what i know so i went from zero what i did was went from zero i typed in a high number that high number was null so that means there's nothing at that high number and then i just went lower so let me go 49 yeah, there's no bones here. But if I did 45, well, I'm dead now, it's gone. But I knew that the bone stopped at 45. So I'm gonna close my game. And then I'm gonna leave myself a note in my player list. I'm gonna say bones go from zero to 45. Now that we know this, we can grab the Unity Engine Animator component off of the player by doing control D here, so current player controller. Actually, we're not gonna do control D, we're gonna copy both of these lines. After getting the player controller, we're gonna get the animator. So I'm gonna do two lines after the check, paste it. I'm gonna do current, I'm gonna just do CUR, cur player animator equals get component animator. If there's no current player animator, we're gonna skip them. So right here, we can get the player position. Now we can get the player position. Now we're gonna get the player bones position. If we do four int j equals zero, the reason why I'm not using int i is because our player list is using int i. So four int j equals zero. J is less than 45. So while j is less than 45, j plus plus we're going to add to j and then we're going to do open brackets 
So this is going to be this is going to loop 45 times. 45 times, because there's 45 bones, I'm going to get the current player animator. I'm going to do call method safe. It returns a Unity C transform, so Unity C transform. And then it was called git bone transform internal. I'm going to double check it with Ida just to make sure. Get bone transform internal. I'm going to copy that right here. So the reason why, let me explain this. The reason why I'm not using find sigs for these functions is because we already have the component that it belongs to. So we're not, we don't need the component. So I'll do a comma, j. This is the argument for the function. So if you remember in Unity Explorer, we were calling that function and it took in a number. This is the number that we're going to pass to it. So I'm going to do auto bone transform equals get bone transform internal and then j, the current bone that we're looking at. I'm going to end that line. So when we have the bone transform, we can do unity vector 3 bone position. Now that we have the bone transform, we can get the position from the transform. So I'm going to do auto bone position equals bone transform get position. So this will be the bone position. Now we're going to do vector to screen position. And then we're going to do if functions world to screen, bone position, screen position. So what our world to screen is doing, it takes in our bone position, and then it sets the screen position vector that we just made to where it is on the screen. So if it's on the screen, I'm going to do render, draw outline text, game font. This is a font that I added from IMGUI. This is already here. You can use this. I'm going to do comma, and the position will be imvec2 screen position dot x. So screen post dot x, comma, screen post dot y. Size, I'm going to use 16.0f. Color, I'm going to do im color 255, 255, 255. That's white. Comma, center true. We're going to center the text comma text. I'm going to do a bracket, not a bracket. I'm going to do percent D, percent D. That's a number. So the text that will be shown is a number and then comma J. So what we're doing is we're looping 45 times. We're getting the bone transform in our loop. So each loop, we're getting the bone transform of the current bone. We're getting the position of the current bone. We're setting a variable called screen position and we're using world to screen to get the position of the bone that we're currently on. Then we draw a number at where the bone is. So we're drawing the bone ID. I'm going to build this and then I'm going to open my game and inject it. Okay, so now we're in a match. I'm going to open a process hacker, I'm going to inject our DLO. And I'm going to turn on player skeleton. Wait, what did I do wrong? I messed something up. What did I do? Player position, bone transform. Oh, never mind. It worked. I don't know why it took a second. Oh, I know what's happening. I know exactly what's happening. Okay. I know the exact issue. So the issue is. When we get bone transform, we're not checking if it's valid or not. So when we get position, it's returning because some of them are invalid. So we're going to do if there is no bone transform, we're going to continue. And then we're going to build this. Let's try this again. All right, we're back in the game. I'm going to go back to process hacker and inject. 
and as you can see every player has their bones number now so what I'll do from here is usually I'll get a good look at a player are right, the games about to start so what I usually do is I get a good look at a player and I take a screenshot I save the screenshot and then I look for I look for more angles just just to be sure so again I'll take another screenshot so we have like I have two screenshots to go off of oh yeah that's a good back view of the player too so I'll take a screenshot there too so I have three screenshots now I'm going to close my game so I did that so we could visually see where the bones are on each player and close my game so in your SDK I'll go up and we have this mouse move function we're going to ignore that for now that's for aimbot so in our SDK I'm going to make a I'm going to close this out so it should be like a plus or a minus here if you're on Visual Studio 2022 I'm on the the beta version so I have this little arrow we're going to drop this down or we're going to close it up I should say I'm going to make a new line after it and I'm going to do a std vector I think it is or no it's a pair something like that give me a second to figure it out yeah I was on the right track I figured it out it's an std vector um, std pair did that wrong I messed up and then another one int int bone underscore pairs and then I open an array equals open an array then you'll do open brackets zero comma zero comma so this this is just starting our array now the screenshots that you took earlier I'm going to look at one of them let me see let me find a good screenshot let me see so right here I have a screenshot of a player looking at me from the front I'll zoom in on the screenshot I can see that it looks like six four or twenty one twenty let me see so the foot bone is 21 the back of the foot is six the knee is four the uh, leg or the thigh is two the pelvis is zero so basically you're playing connect the dots here so 21 to 6 in your in your cheat you'll do 21 6 so these are basically where the lines are going to connect to which numbers the lines are going to connect to so if you look at your screenshot I'll go 21 6 6 to 4 so I'm going to do control D 6 goes to 4 and then I'm going to do 4 goes to 2 4 goes to 2 not that way, four goes to two. So basically you're connecting the dots. That's basically what you're doing. Connect the dots. Twenty one six, six, four, four goes to two, zero goes to one. So we're gonna make each leg. So I'm gonna do a comment. This is right leg. Four to two. Two to zero. Two zero. And then we're gonna do left leg. 21, 20 to 5, I meant 20 to 5. So I'm, I'm just going to speed this part up because this is, this is boring, but you, you get the idea. You're basically playing connect the dots. So I did all of them right here. Maybe compare it with my picture. As you can see, 21 goes to 6, 6 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2, 0, 7, 0, 7. Yeah, I did everything. If, you, if you're working on the same game as me, you can copy these right here. Pause the video. I'll scroll past. There you go. So your thing should look just like this. I have an error right here because you need to do a semicolon after doing the array. So that error should go away. I don't know why it's still showing. My, my Visual Studio is kind of slow. Yeah, there we go. No issues found. So yeah, this, this is the whole bone array right here. Now that we've made a bone array, we can go back to our main. We're still rendering the same numbers. We need to change it to lines. So the way that we do that 
is instead of looping 45 times, I'm going to delete this. And then I'm going to do for std pair int int bone pair. And then we do SDK, oop, not SKD, SDK, bone pairs, open brackets. So the bone pair variable is each bone pair. We're basically looping through our bone pairs and our SDK. We're looping through these and we're getting each one. So for every pair and bone pairs, we're going to do, so we have the animator. I'm just, just making sure. We have the animator, we're getting the player position, so we need to get the bone position. We're gonna do animator, call method safe, unity, C transform. It's a pointer, make sure to put that star, and then get bone transform internal. And then we're going to do bone pairs. So bone pair, not bone pairs, bone pair dot first. So this is the first bone of the pair. Put a semicolon. I'm gonna do auto bone one equals. So we're getting the first bone of the bone pair. And then we're going to do control D bone two equals bone pair dot second. Who not swap second. So we're doing bone pairs, SDK bone pairs. We're looping through bone bone one and bone two. We're getting the transform for both bones. Then we're going to do if, if there isn't a bone one and, or no, not and, we're gonna do or, or bone two. So if there isn't a bone one or a bone two, we're going to continue. And this is just check if bone is valid. So we're making sure that both of the bones are valid before even trying to get their positions. Then we're gonna do auto bone one pos equals bone one get position. Then we're gonna do control D, same thing for bone two, bone two get position. Then we're going to do if, oh no, not yet. We're gonna do vector two we're gonna do screen, we're gonna do pos one. I'm gonna name it pos one. Pos one and pos two. Now we do the world to screen. We're gonna do if functions, world to screen, bone one pos, pos one, and then we're gonna do and functions, world to screen, bone two pos, and then pause two, and then do open braces. So if both of these are true, if both bones are valid on the screen, if both bones on screen, we're going to do an IMGY get background draw list. That's a pointer. So we're going to do add line, and then the position one, position two. So position one will be the first bone, I am vec two, pos one, dot x, pos two, dot x, I mean, no, dot not dot x, dot y, comma, and then we're getting position two, so I'm vec two, we're just gonna copy this, and then we're gonna do pos two. So we're going to draw a line between the bones, comma, the color, I am color, whatever color you want, 255, 255, 255 comma, thickness, I'm gonna do 2.0. And then right here, so we just made a skeleton ESP. If we do this, the skeletons will render. We need to make it abide by our little toggle in our menu though. So player skeleton right here, and copy that. So this entire loop, I'm going to do if vars player skeleton, open braces, and I'm gonna copy the whole loop uh, highlight it, press Control X, and then paste it. So if player skeleton is enabled, we're going to loop through each bone in our bone list, and we're going to get the transform, we're going to get the bone's position, and then we're going to render it on our screen. Go ahead and build that and open my game.
Once again, I got the melon loader error. Just ignore it. Open the game again. Okay, my game is loaded. I'm going to inject with process hacker. And then I'm going to click player skeleton. Oh my god. <laughs> That's not right. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see what's wrong here. Oh, I see the issue. Yeah, I see the issue. I accidentally put POS2 on the first line. So look, when I do add line, I put POS1, POS2. That's not right. I'm supposed to do POS1 for both and then POS2 for these two. Yeah. So pay attention to your code. I wasn't paying attention, so let me build. That's my bad. That looks see, that's the thing with code too. One small little change can affect your entire thing. I bet that was one number. That was one number and watch. I changed it and it's going to work now. So we're back in the game, gonna inject. Player skeleton. Yep, there we go. See now they work. So that one number is what made it not work. See how crazy that is? There we go, we have skeletons on every player. Alright, tomorrow I'll work on aimbot and uh, silent aim. I think that's a long enough video for today. <laughs>